Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Shabbat Shalom. Feliz Sabido. So, um, Susan asked me about uh, this sermon. She asked me the other day what my plans were for a sermon. And I said, you know, I hadn't decided yet. And she gave me this reading from Hebrews 12 to, <clears throat> and I thought it was uh, perfect for a communion day. Because we're going to talk about, you know, actually this morning was kind of a great Sabbath school for Communion Day because we talked about the idea of leadership and Sabbath and how appropriate leadership and the good leaders in the Bible have always been those that followed God's will rather than their own, for their own self-edification uh, to build themselves up, uh, but they did rather to be of benefit to, the, to their um, to the people, the residents of, of their kingdom. But I want to go back, and what, what I wanted to do today is we're going to read, uh, we're going to go through Hebrews 12, uh, verses 1 through 14, I believe. And that's, we're going to have this a little shorter, because I just want to focus on the idea of the communion today and what, what our purposes are. So Hebrews 12, 1 starts out this way. 12 starts out this way. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a huge crowd of witnesses to the life of faith, now see, <clears throat> some people, um, I've heard them sort of maybe not misinterpret this, but pass over this um, part where it says to the life of faith, right? Not just witnesses that have gone out and preached the gospel message like the disciples did, but these are witnesses to the life of faith, it says. So let us strip off every weight that slows us down. Who takes on the yoke, our burdens? Jesus does. Especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance that the race that God has set before us. And one of the questions, two of the questions that we have to ask, one is, who are these great, who is this great uh, crowd of witnesses? Well, you'll study this on your own. Because to know that, you have to go back a chapter to chapter 11 in Hebrews. But it's talking about Jacob and about Abraham. And, and <clears throat> it's talking about the great leaders and those of faith within the Bible. And what it's saying is that, is that since we are surrounded by the lessons of all of this faith, then we have the ability to step out in faith as well. And as a result of that, to get rid of the burdens that are weighing us down and keeping us from moving towards Christ. And that's what these burdens do. <clears throat> when I was training, actually years ago, and I was training for <clears throat> the Florida Ironman triathlon. And um, one of the ways that I would train is I would put weights on my ankles, and I would put on a backpack with a 40-pound sandbag in it, and I would go out and run with those weights and with that sandbag. And you know, you just can't turn in the kind of time that you would normally turn in. But what those burdens do is they help to strengthen us as well. They bring us to a place where God can use us in his own way. Miss White writes this. She says, The weights that are here referred to are the evil habits and practices we have formed by following our own natural dispositions. So let us lay aside every weight, it says. Let's divorce ourselves from our own evil dispositions. You know, um, I, I believe that... Um, the reason we continue to sin is not necessarily because we, we don't know that it's wrong, although that is the case sometimes. We just, we aren't consciously aware that what we're doing is sinful. And that's where we call upon the Holy Spirit that we can see ourselves in, through Jesus' eyes and then we can start to recognize those things. You know, when we talked about this coming into communion over the last month, is pray and ask the Holy Spirit to show you your sinful nature and those specific sins because Sometimes we just don't recognize um, those sins that they are. But we keep them at times because they serve us a purpose. Is that right? I mean, let's admit it. Uh, sometimes anger serves us a purpose because it keeps people away when we want to be isolated or alone. Or we may engage in an ad addiction because it satisfies this sort of dopamine rush that we need, that we have in our brains. So it serves us a purpose. Miss White is saying that we need to divorce ourselves from that. 
from our own evil dispositions. We need that there's the bad dog and the good dog inside of every one of us, is how I've heard it said. And, and who you are depends on which dog you feed. We don't really ever kill it. We just put it aside as long as we're, we're, um, we're bearing on the full armor of Christ. So the second verse, which is the verse we started with, says, we do this by keeping our eyes on Jesus, the champion who initiates and perfects our faith. This is the, this is the part of it that, um, um, that caused me um, some confusion. It says, because of the joy awaiting him, he endured the cross, disregarding its shame. What was the joy that was awaiting Christ? That's, that's what I spent more time researching in this uh, study than I did anything else. I, I like to think that I do God's will, that I do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. I love other people, and I hope to treat them that way because Jesus loves me, right? If, if you were in the Sabbath school this morning, we talked about leadership. Jesus Christ led by example. God is love. I want to be, um, I want to have that joy that it talks about, the peace that exceeds all human understanding. But what is it? <clears throat> is it eternal life? Is it being in heaven? What if there was no reward of eternal life? Would I still do God's will? Would I still do the work of the Lord? Would I still love my neighbor? and love the Lord my God with all my heart and my soul? Would I still preach the great gospel message of Jesus Christ coming to the earth and dying and being resurrected? Now, I know there's a part to that that he's waiting for me, and he's got a place for me, and that that's where I want to be. I want to shed off this old body. You know, I, I woke up at 2 o'clock this morning and didn't sleep most of the rest of the night because it was just one of those pain nights. You ever have those? I don't have them often, but when I do, they're bad. And this last night was just a night when the pain was just excruciating all night, you know. And, and I, would, I would love to I think about that joy of heaven and the new body and the no more pain or suffering or no more tears or sadness. But is that why I do the things that I do? Is that the joy that was awaiting Jesus Christ? Or was it the joy that he did was his father saying that he was proud of him, that he did his father's work? I want to go back to this, um, to Miss White and her writings here. And she says, There is a joy and a cross set before each one of you. You may think the cross is hard to bear, but remember there is a joy before you. You need not feel, if a little cloud passes before your mind, that God has forsaken you. Take your Bible, turn right to the Psalms, and read how we are to praise the Lord at all times. So we're told to never give up. Right? We're told to run the race of endurance. You know, human beings are not, um, are not created for speed. We're created for endurance. Most of us have muscle tissue that is there for endurance. The entire, if you remember your biochemistry, the Krebs cycle, which, which takes the oxygenated blood and it becomes lactic acid and then it's reoxygenated and it turns back into... Uh, peruvic acid, and the, the body is able to use that. We're made for endurance. That's what we're made for. Um, and we run, we run that race of endurance is what it talks about because we know that there's something at the end that's waiting for us. I run a couple marathons in my older day, younger days when, when I had all my own body parts and, uh, and I could do that without things falling off and people having to pick them up in the is this yours? <laughs> and, and in those days, what kept me going was knowing that at the end of the race was this little medal that I got to wear. And it was my ability to say, hey, you did it. That's all. That my joy of running that race, trust me, was not coming in first. In fact, the, the one uh, triathlon that I did, um, the one-legged lady beat me on the run up to the, uh, um, to the finish line. And I thought I would be devastated by that. But in fact, I wasn't because I finished. And that is what my goal was. Hebrews 12, 3 and 4 says, Think of all the hostility he endured from sinful people. Then you won't become weary 
and give up. So Jesus is what? He's our example. And he led us by example. After all, you have not given your lives in your struggle. You have not yet given your lives in your struggle against sin. So those of us who are here to hear this message are people who are still alive. And we have not lost our lives to the sins that we have yet, it's talking about. But from a spiritual perspective, we are expected to die daily. And we die to the life that we have. We die to the bad dog that's inside of us. We stop feeding it so that we can nurture from the Holy Spirit the good part of us. It says, God is full of mercy. All he wants for you is that you will open the door of your heart and let him come in and sanctify your heart and your mind. And this continues on uh, in 285 from this light. Part of the process is to be able to accept discipline, to accept rebuke from God. Oftentimes, <clears throat> I believe, I'll speak for myself, when I um, am being disciplined one way or another, I have a hard time accepting it. There's a lot of pride involved in it. If I um, mess something up and somebody has to straighten me out, I get uh, um, defensive, right? There's a resistance that builds up against it. Sometimes that happens because I don't respect the person that's dis disciplining me. I may not think that they know more than I do or that they're in a position. Maybe I think they're hypocritical in what they're saying. And so the discipline, the words that they say to me don't mean much. But when discipline comes from the Lord, because see, the God that I worship is the God that created the whole universe. We, we were talking, the grandkids were up, uh, um, some of them, um, the day after Christmas. And, and we were talking about this concept of where God came from and trying to tell my six-year-old grandson, well, he's always been here. But where was he before that? Well, there was no before that. And, and where, where, was he, where will he be afterwards? And there is no afterwards. It's this, he's been here forever and he'll be here forever. There's no beginning and there's no end with God. It's just something that's always been. That blows my little peanut human brain. I can't imagine what it does to a six-year-old. But they wanted, they wanted this, this conversation. And we talked about this idea of obedience and discipline and how important that was. So Hebrews goes on with this and it says, And have you forgotten the encouraging words God spoke to you as his children? He said, My child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. And don't give up when he corrects you. Isn't that what often happens? We get frustrated. We do something wrong. We can usually walk away from it. But when someone finds out we did it wrong and they point it out, there was this, there was this song um, back in my earlier days in college. Um, I would play guitar and go to these clubs and sing. And I know you wouldn't know that today by my joining in the hymns, but, but that was true in those days. And there was this song by Jackson Brown and the line in it says, don't confront me with my failures because I'm well aware of them. And the idea is, usually when I do wrong, I know I'm doing wrong. The last thing I need is someone to tell me that I'm doing wrong. But the fact is, is that because I do the same thing over and over again, I do need someone to, to tell me. I do need discipline and rebuke. So, so when I am disciplined and it's appropriate, it's easy to quit the activity. It's easy just to stop. When I played football in high school and I would make a bad play and the coach, Coach Waldo would come there and he'd be all over me. He'd be in my face screaming and yelling at me. It was easy just to say, you know what, I don't need to put up with this. But I, I wanted to put up with it. It's something that was important to me and I didn't want to just walk away because I was being disciplined. It says, for the Lord disciplines those who, <clears throat> who he loves. And he punishes each one he accepts as his child. So maybe the fact that if we're not getting disciplined and we're not being rebuked by the Lord, uh, maybe we got a bigger problem. Revelation 3.19 says, Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repentant and repent. What does it mean to be zealous? To be excited about it. You know, I go into the, uh, I went into Publix <clears throat> a few days ago to get stuff because the kids are coming up. And uh, it was a zoo because 
apparently I was not the only person who forgot to get last minute items right before the Christmas dinners and the holiday dinners and that. And so I only had like, um, I only had like one item, you know? So I went up to the customer service desk. I was gonna go up there and check out because it was long lines and, and people forgot more things than I did, you know, in each of their baskets. And there was, a, there was a lady up there who was buying lottery tickets. And, you know, I'm not gonna say anything about that. I don't do it, but whatever, you know. But <clears throat> they definitely are inconvenient when you're trying to just get checked out and someone's buying ticket after ticket after ticket of all the different ones. But she was zealous about it. She was excited about it. She was going to win this time. This was her Christmas present. You know, it was $49 million. And she was telling everybody who wanted to listen what she was going to do with all that money. What if we were just as zealous about, about um, our relationship with Christ? I've got a much bigger gift than the lottery could ever give me. And that is the promise of eternal life with, with God. And why aren't I out? Why aren't I out as zealously shouting about that as this lady who was so zealously excited in pursuing her own lottery winnings or who thought of that? So our our commission then is to rejoice, right? Now to re rejoice in the good things. How easy is that? How about in the bad things? It's not as easy to rejoice in the bad things. I think that's just human nature. I don't think there's anyone that should be ashamed of the fact that when something, some crisis befalls them, that our first response is not always rejoicing. For me, it's work the problem, work the problem, work the problem. That's how I was taught. First thing I do is I try to fix it. And then after I've not been able to do that and the pain is significant enough, then I find a way. When, when we were out, we, we have this acre behind us and I've been trying to get it cleared a bit. We're gonna build a wilderness camp for the kids and um, we're, it's inundated with what are called, what, you ever hear what's called wait a minute vines? So when I was in South America <clears throat> in the military, we'd be in the jungle and we'd have our rucksacks on and we're marching through and these vines were everywhere and they would grab hold and you'd be going, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute as you try to get these vines up. And they're all over the property. I've just never seen anything quite like it. And they had these thick um, points on them, you know, these prickers on them and everything. And Susan was... Uh, was um, wisely telling me that I should probably be wearing long pants and not my shorts out in there while I was doing it. But I, I didn't listen, you know. And so I went out and there was this big tree uh, and I'm like, I don't need, there's nothing around, you know, it's not that bad. I'm, we're just gonna cut this tree down. So we, my friend John came over and we wedged it and then we cut the tree and as the tree came down, there was all these vines that were in the tree and I was standing in the middle of them and it ripped them all past my legs and I looked like I was in a cat fight um, or when I got done. Um, I have to accept discipline graciously and I have to re learn to rejoice in the Lord always because the vines didn't grab me and pull me up, the tree didn't kick back as a result of them and, and uh, crush me at the time. Hebrews 12, again, verses seven to nine says, as you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who ever heard of a child who was never disciplined by its father? Well, there are those. And what happens to those kids usually? They go wild for two reasons. One is children crave discipline because they want to feel safe and secure. The second is if they're not, then they're never taught there's any boundaries. And, and so they just, there are no boundaries for them. If God doesn't discipline you as he does all his children, it means that you are illegitimate and are not really his children at all. Since we respect our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we submit even more to the discipline of the father of our spirits and live forever? Miss White goes on and says, if you will only follow on to know the Lord and do his bidding, you will know by your experience that God will suggest thoughts to you as you attempt to speak words to those who are around you, to restrain them from doing wrong and to point out to them the way of life. See, we often talk about saving other people, but we don't do that, do we? We can't save anybody. All we can do is plant the seed. I often heard it said that we don't carry the sinner, we simply carry the message because it's too big a burden for us. Rejoice in the Lord always, and through his grace you may overcome one difficulty after another. 
Such an experience will strengthen your faith. You may, that you may believe that it is possible for you to be an overcomer. See what it's saying? If we have faith that we can overcome small things, and you overcome many small things because of that faith, because God is there with us, eventually we don't feel like we can overcome we feel like we're an overcomer. It becomes part of our character and our nature, and therefore nothing else can threaten us or challenge us because we have the experience and the faith to move forward. Divine discipline brings divine peace. It goes on to say, for our earthly fathers disciplined us for a few years, doing the best they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful. <clears throat> but afterward, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. I actually got this from Matthew Henry's Bible commentary. It says, our whole life here is a state of childhood, talking about here on earth, and imperfect as to spiritual things. Therefore, we must submit to the discipline of such a state. When we come to a perfect state, we shall be fully reconciled to all God's chastisement of us now. God's correction is not condemnation. And I think that needs to be uh, the most important thing in my mind that we learn. When a father disciplines their children in love, it's not condemnation. They're not condemning that child. What they're doing is trying to teach and help that child to have a better life going forward. <clears throat> the chastening may be born with patience and greatly promote holiness. Let us then learn to consider the afflictions brought on us by the malice of men as corrections sent by our wise and gracious Father for our spiritual good. In closing, <clears throat> and I don't think I'm the first one to say this, we reap what we sow. Hmm? Oh, did I, I spelled it wrong, didn't I? <laughs> well, you can blame that on spell check. Wait. I want to do this right. Thank you. So we reap what we sow. Or what we sow. <laughs> Spell check. Hebrews 12, 12 and 13. Uh, it finishes up the chapter. It says, so take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. We've got to pick ourselves up and dust ourselves off as the song goes and start all over again. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame will not fall but become strong. We become leaders in this light. I'll finish this. Um, Ms. White says, every Christian who is happy in the Lord will work zealously to bring the same happiness into the heart and life of one who is in need and affliction. Followers of Christ will produce their own happiness in the hearts of others by performing Christ-like works. They will diffuse an atmosphere which is pure, peaceful, and Christ-like. They will act out heavenly attributes and will produce fruit after the heavenly kind and quality. That which they sow, they also, they shall also reap. Amen? All right, so here's what we're going to do.